Last month, we looked at Taboo Conspiracy and his moon landing video, putting him firmly in his place in the process. Well, it turns out he didn't take that too well. So today, we're gonna to have a look at the next part of his video, and we're gonna have some help this time around from the casual spaceman. Hello all, and welcome along to another episode of Tin Fall Tuesday with me, Simon Dan. Thank you very much for joining me. Yes, today we are back with Taboo Conspiracy, taking a look at his moon landing hoax video. Last time we spent the whole video talking about his first exhibit, the Lunar Lander. Today, we're gonna to join him as he starts talking about what he calls Exhibit 2. Exhibit 2, Kubrick's Apollo 11 lunar docking footage. So, after the astronauts were able to play around on the moon up to three days, the astronauts had to hop back into the ascent stage of the lunar lander and blast off the moon and catch up with the command module that had been orbiting at 4,000 miles per hour up to three days. Fortunately, the NASA astronauts knew exactly where the command module was after it had supposedly traveled 768,000 miles. It's also important to note that not one person on Earth was able to film this command module orbiting the moon with a telescope. Really? You think someone with a telescope on Earth could film something that small? If you're using a telescope on Earth with a magnification that is too high, you will literally be zooming in on the Earth's atmosphere. You won't be able to see a thing. You can supposedly see dark craters on the moon that are only one kilometer in diameter. Is the command module one kilometer in diameter though? No. But you can't see a large chrome spacecraft that would be reflecting sunlight like a mirror orbiting the moon dozens of times? There should be dozens of amateur astronomy videos showing the command module orbiting the moon, but they don't exist. In 1969? Really? Is that a joke? I struggle to take a video today through my telescope with good equipment, and you expect people to have taken loads of videos of it back in 1969 from Earth. But I especially love this Apollo 11 redocking footage. This is absolutely ridiculous. These are 1960s special effects and are obviously fake to even a child. Look at the jerky motions. Look at the total lack of thrusters being used. I've had many people ask me if this is genuine NASA footage, and yes, it is. I actually feel pretty bad for you if you believe that's a spaceship that just blasted off from the moon traveling at 4,000 miles per hour. And I actually feel pretty bad for you that you can't see that this footage is actually sped up, which allows for that jerky movement. Maybe you noticed that the video footage of the docking lunar lander appears eerily similar and as fake as Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. It looks nothing like it. Exhibit 3, the preposterous Apollo Ascent Stage. The last video was shockingly ridiculous. Again, it's unbelievable that anyone with a brain, let alone a degree, believes that was a real spaceship traveling at 4,000 miles per hour docking in lunar orbit. Institutionalized conformity is amazingly powerful as even individuals with a PhD won't allow themselves to question their institutions. Because they have studied everything they need to know from the ground up. They're not just told it. But, but this gets even better. This is a official NASA footage of the Apollo 15 and 17 ascent stages. Remember the engine was never even allegedly turned on beforehand. In addition to the preposterous and obviously fake footage, NASA claims that it used a remote control to operate the camera on the moon buggy left behind and then beamed that video footage back to Earth 234,000 miles away. We didn't even have decent television remote controls in 1972, but NASA could not only operate the camera from 234,000 miles, NASA could also pan up and follow the lunar ascent stage and zoom out all in real time without delay. Actually, there was a delay. Here I am from a previous video explaining a bit more about it. The camera wasn't actually available for Apollo 11 and was used for Apollos 15, 16 and 17. 
It was attached to the lunar rover and set a certain distance back from the lunar lander. And the plan was to make the camera tilt to show the Apollo X aircraft taking off from the moon when commanded from Earth. However, during the takeoff of Apollo 15, the tilt mechanism failed, so the lander flew out the shot pretty quickly. During the Apollo 16 takeoff, the rover was parked too close to the lander and they didn't get a great shot. For the Apollo 17 takeoff, because of the distance to the moon and the delay in the signal getting there, the command to tilt the camera was given three seconds before liftoff. Look again, the camera zooms out and pans up in real time and this remote control was supposedly 234,000 miles away. That, ladies and gentlemen, is impossible. Does anyone here actually think this looks real? Me. One other thing. Notice that there is no thrust from the nozzle. Yes, there should have been a huge flame and obvious light source from the nozzle. No, there shouldn't. Here is a short clip from the Vintage Space YouTube channel telling us why. But the lunar module didn't burn the same combination of fuel and oxidizer. Instead, it used hypergolic fuels, or hypergols. Hypergols burn on contact. They don't need an ignition source, which means all you have to do is open a valve, let the two mix, and boom, you're off. Which is great with spaceflight because that's one less thing to worry about. Another characteristic of hypergols is that they typically burn clear. This is the case of the lunar module. Both the lunar module ascent stage and descent stage used a mix of aerosene 50 and dinitrogen tetroxide, a fuel and an oxidizer that burn on contact with a characteristic clear flame. Exhibit 4. No blast crater and no scorching. This is a 7,500 pound thruster. Look at its power. Look at its heat. Look at the light it creates. Look at the dust it kicks up. And yes, the Apollo astronauts claim that its lunar lander also kicked up dust, and the phony footage shows the same. The Apollo lunar lander had a bigger thruster at 10,000 pounds. Obviously, the 10,000 pound thruster failed to displace or scorch any of the lunar soil. Okay, look. If you take a look at the video in question, you can clearly see dust being blown away from the lunar module upon descent. It's also important to note that the lack of atmosphere on the moon means that the dust will fall straight back down to the moon's surface, as there's no air currents to keep it aloft. Of course, the real killer is that the engine of the lunar lander shuts off around six feet from the lunar surface. In one case, you can see the nozzle is actually bent as it collapsed on the surface. The nozzle is literally buried in the ground, and still it did not affect the lunar soil. It's very clear a crane sat this lunar lander down on the soil. There was no rocket. A crane. Yes, very clear. Clear as mud, matey. Exhibit 5. The marionette astronauts. Ah, Casual Spaceman is going to help out with this one. Thanks for helping out, old chap. Away you go, buddy. I already touched on this in my last video, but the evidence is compelling. The astronauts were dangling from wires, and you can see it multiple times. This video proves that the astronauts did dangle by wires. There really isn't much more to say then. How in the world do you believe in this nonsense? Hi Dan, thank you for allowing me the pleasure and the privilege to do this collab video with you. This is a subject close to my heart, so of course I'd jump at the chance to do it. Well. I get to start with the easy one, Exhibit 5. This is an old one, but always seems to crop up with moon hoaxes time and time again. What you're seeing is a reflection from the aerials on the life support systems on their backpacks. The communication system to communicate with each other and mission control. Then a flare from the reflection on the lens of the camera. It's that simple. Moon hoaxes always seem to cherry pick a few seconds of this clip among many hours of movie clips from all the Apollo missions on the lunar surface where this effect does not occur. Simples. Right, I'm back. Thank you very much. Exhibit 6, the unmistakable Apollo movie backdrop. You can clearly see the use of 1960s movie artificial backdrops here. It's obvious. Is it? The backdrop lines are visible throughout all the missions. Are they? In this case, you can even see the carpet used to blend in with the backdrop. 
no reasonable person can deny that these are movie backdrops. This was not filmed on the moon. Poor exhibit. It seems like you're just saying it's a backdrop without any evidence. Exhibit 7. Thousands of studio quality photos. Our NASA actors were able to impossibly produce thousands of studio quality photos. What's wrong about that? It is the fact that the astronauts did not have the ability to use the viewfinder to frame their shots or to manually adjust aperture, focus, or shutter speed and do so all without the benefit of secondary light sources. Yes, because if you're going to fake a moon landing, you'd certainly produce photos that people would think impossible to produce up there. You'd definitely do that if you didn't want to get caught. Or, the most reasonable explanation, they did take them and they were good quality. But the astronauts managed to do this nearly every time. This can't happen in real life. Here's how McGowan put it. Skipping ahead two sentences. Simply stated, it would not have been possible to capture any of the images allegedly shot on the moon in the manner that NASA says they were captured. Oh, so because it's written down like that, it means it's true, is it? Hmm. I can think of several more examples where that's not the case. NASA wants the world to believe that 5,771 photographs were taken in the combined time of 4,834 minutes over an alleged six missions. This equates to Apollo 11, one photo every 15 seconds. Apollo 12, one photo every 27 seconds. Apollo 14, one photo every 62 seconds. Apollo 15, one photo every 44 seconds. Apollo 16, one photo every 29 seconds. Apollo 17, one photo every 26 seconds. Given all the facts, was it possible for two men to take that many photos in so short a time? Any professional photographer will tell you it cannot be done. Except it probably could be done. Professional photographers can take over 100 photos in one hour. And I know it's not the same, but I can take 22 photos in 10 seconds with my iPhone. Exhibit 8. The Liars Press Conference. Oh, it's back to Casual Spaceman for this one. One of NASA's biggest blunders in 1969 was the fact that it didn't hire very good actors. On August 12, 1969, Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, and Buzz Aldrin attended their first major press conference. This is the first big conference of the Apollo 11 astronauts, and it was only two days after the astronauts were re released from quarantine. Their faces tell it all. They are not happy with what they are doing. They look like they were being forced to tell a lie, and they showed no excitement that would accompany three men who walked on the moon. But the funniest part to me is when one of the reporters asked whether they could see stars while on the surface of the moon. Armstrong said that he couldn't recall seeing stars, and then Michael Collins added that he didn't remember seeing any. You can see Armstrong was bothered by Collins' answer. Collins' answer is hilarious because Michael Collins was never on the surface and so he had no reason to answer the question. In addition, Michael Collins was the pilot of the command module, and he would have allegedly seen the most amazing show of stars on the dark side of the moon, better than any person that had lived up till that time. Michael Collins supposedly saw the dark side of the moon 27 times, and he doesn't remember seeing any stars. Well, Dan, Exhibit 8 is a classic case of cherry-picking and hiding the whole truth of what was said during this now famous press conference. Firstly, Apollo 11 had already splashed down almost three weeks previous to this press conference, so I'm confident that the initial buoyancy of what they had just achieved had somewhat died down. But make no mistake, they were still proud and excited what they achieved. So I don't really understand what the narrator of this video expect them, expects them to act like, particularly when they hadn't been out long of quarantine and hadn't really had much time to spend with their families. Not only that, this press conference was full of pretty technical information, starting with a 45 minutes of a technical presentation and then a Q&A session with most of the questions were also of a technical nature, with a smattering of some comical comments from all three. As for the question asked of them about the stars, what you have to do is listen to the whole question asked by astronomer Sir Patrick Moore. But conveniently, this video cuts out everything that was said, including the question asked by Patrick. So let's play the actual question asked and the response from Armstrong and Collins. I've deliberately skipped past Buzz Aldrin's response about the lunar surface and got to the point we are making about here. I don't remember seeing any. 
So as we heard from Patrick Moore, the question was, when you looked up at the sky, could you actually see the stars in the solar corona in spite of the glare? Again, the key words here are, could you see stars in the solar corona? What Patrick Moore is referring to is the experiment that was carried out by the Apollo 11 crew to photograph the solar corona of the sun on the way to the moon and on the surface of the moon. The corona is the outermost part of the sun's atmosphere and is usually hidden by the bright light of the sun's surface. That makes it difficult to see without using special instruments, or as we see here during a solar eclipse. So Neil Armstrong was replying that he could not see any stars from the daylight side of the moon without looking through the optics. So of course Neil could, so not, could not see any stars from the daylight side of the moon without the naked eye on the lunar surface. Firstly, there's practically no atmosphere on the moon to filter out sunlight. Plus, the high levels of reflection from the moon's surface means the human eye, nor the lens of a camera, would be able to detect any stars because of the human eye is flooded with much brighter light from the sun and the lunar reflection over the dim lights of distant stars. As an example, go outside during daylight. Could you make out any stars at this point? No, of course not. Not only that, he said he could not see any stars without looking through the optics. So at no point did Neil mention he ever saw stars at any point during the mission. And Michael Collins, as he was a command module pilot, did not set foot on the moon, was confirming he did not recall seeing any stars, referring to the corona experiment. As for Neil being shocked or not liking Collins' reply, he clearly looked at him, nodded in agreement, said something that looked like approval and looked away. I failed to see how Armstrong was shocked or disappointed with that reply. Well, that's all from me, Dan. Again, thanks very much for allowing me to be a part of this. I hope that helps. I'm a casual spaceman. Bye for now. Thank you very much for that, buddy. Right, I think we'll leave that there today. I think I've had enough of these silly exhibits from Taboo Conspiracy. We'll round off the rest in a third video. Huge thanks to Casual Spaceman for your help today. I'll leave the link to his channel in the description. Please do check him out, he is fantastic. If you enjoyed it today, then please, please do like and subscribe. It'd be thoroughly appreciated. I have been Simon Dan. Have yourselves a great week, and I'll see you all on Friday where D Marble isn't happy. See you then. <laughs>